This webinar was developed by the Society for Male Reproduction and Urology and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While this webinar reflects the views of the panelists, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to dictate an exclusive course of treatment. Members should always use their best judgment in determining a course of action and be guided by the needs of the individual patient, available resources, and institutional or clinical practice limitations. This webinar was reviewed and approved by the ASRM and SMRU management. Welcome to a webinar on male reproductive health, science, and laboratory issues during the COVID-19 era, developed jointly by ASRM and SMRU. I am Sarah Ramaya, Curriculum Designer at ASRM. Joining us are panelists Kathleen Huang, Jim Hotelling, and Mike Eisenberg, moderated by Dr. Natan Barhama and my colleague, Jessica Goldstein. Before we begin, please note, the views expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views of ASRM. All attendees will be muted except the presenters. Time at the end of the presentation will be reserved for questions. Please type a question in the question chat box window at any time. We will read as many selected questions as possible to the presenters during the allotted question and answer time. A recording of this webinar will be archived on the ASRM website in the coming weeks. Please watch your email for notification. Let me introduce our moderator. Dr. Barhama is director of the Center for Male Reproductive Health at Reproductive Medicine Associates of New York and is on faculty at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is the current president of the Society for Male Reproduction and Urology of ASRM. Dr. Barhama. Thank you for the introduction. The COVID-19 pandemic has really created a health, uh, humanitarian and economic crisis for all of us. And I want to just begin by acknowledging that as president of SMRU and being able to see the ASRM leadership uh, respond with such focus and commitment, um, sincerity and, and, and um, effort to address how COVID uh, affects fertility and reproductive medicine and practice has been something that um, it was a, is a true privilege. And my gratitude for ASRM to for their commitment to education, and this webinar is uh, an example of that, uh, including the staff that are working behind the scenes, Jessica and Sarah. Uh, this webinar will explore the impact of COVID uh, on the diagnosis and treatment of male reproductive health and uh, help us understand the what is known and what is not known about the physiological effects, how to practice male reproductive medicine in this era, and tools and instruments that we could utilize as patients uh, continue to uh, be uh, socially distancing. I'd like to begin by uh, introducing our first speaker. Dr. Hotelling is a associate professor at the University of Utah. He's the director of, men's, of the men's health program uh, at the University of Utah and also is an editor of Fertility and Sterility. And he will begin this webinar by focusing on SARS-CoV-2, semen and male reproductive health. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today about a uh, an important topic that's uh, certainly a significant component in our field of handling the uh, the pandemic and and may depending on the the results of all this stuff going on in terms of whether the disease is sexually transmitted have have more far reaching implications. So these are my disclosures. None of them are are directly related to this work. So I'm going to talk about virology 101. You have to know a little bit about this to understand kind of what's going on and how we look at it. And then we'll also talk about the impact on long-term male reproductive health. And then finally, we will talk about what studies are needed in the future. And I think it's really important to look at things holistically like this to have an understanding of what's going on. So SARS-CoV-2 I've sort of investigated this a little bit and learned, uh, to be honest, more about virology than I ever thought I would. But the important thing to understand is that the virus to get into cells needs two receptors, um, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and TEMPRS2 or transmembrane serine protease 2. This was a pretty good slide that I found looking at uh, the tissues where that's co-expressed. So obviously, 
you know, respiratory tissue. If you look at the yellow and the, you know, bluish dots, you see where it's, uh, it's expressed and that's what's needed to get into cells. And one of the big questions is, can it get into testicular tissue? So big question is, why is the virus so aggressive? And I think it's important to understand this to be able to put the rest of this in context. So um, we have no immunity as this is a novel virus. The other thing that the data would show is that other SARS, um, you know, diseases and coronaviruses, especially the ones that come from bats are particularly virulent because bats apparently have a pretty amazing uh, immune system. And no one's entirely sure how it got to humans. Uh, it's thought that it may have gone uh, through a pangolin um, that then somehow was transmitted to humans, but it's obviously, you know, the worldwide case pre prevalence is, is pushing 6 million and even be over 6 million by now. And it's resulted in a tremendous number of um, people getting infected with the disease and, and deaths, um, tragically. And this is a picture of, you know, bodies from, from New York City. And that's obviously been, uh, unfortunately, an epicenter of a lot of this. So it's really unprecedented since the 1918 influenza outbreak. Um, the 1918 influenza outbreak uh, can provide some insight into what's going on in terms of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, and looking at COVID. Um, it was actually far worse in terms of the number of people that actually died from it. And it was also worse in the, in the aspect that it tended to predominantly affect younger children, um, which was horrific. But if you look at the U.S., I mean, global deaths are, are pushing 400,000 and the U.S. has 100. 104,000, and that's probably underreported, uh, as are some of these other countries. So what did the 1918 flu do to fertility? If you look at some of the demographic literature, you know, the flu started in 1918, and then, you know, kind of, you know, calmed down a little bit in the summer, and then came roaring back with a vengeance in the, in the fall and winter. And you actually see the first thing that you notice is that fertility actually went up. Um, and a lot of that is a demographic effect. Um, you know, the birth rate went up. And a lot of that is a demographic effect just because people had more time and were quarantined and, you know, maybe were bored to put it uh, politely. And then you see that it goes down significantly after that. And a lot of that is due to not necessarily the fact uh, of the virus, but the economic implications of that. And I think we will probably see the same thing here. So impact of other viruses on fertility. This was a nice uh, review. The other viruses can and do impact. Uh, the male reproductive tract, Zika, obviously is something that the, the ASRM was out in front of um, and, you know, with all of its effects and actually, you know, funded research grants looking at this, Ebola actually gets into the semen, HIV, mumps. Um, and a lot of these viruses, if you look here, can cause orchitis, epididymitis, and, you know, importantly altered uh, sperm parameters. So the big question is, does SARS-CoV-2 get into the semen? Uh, and to answer that question, we kind of have to look at three different, uh, two different components, the, the fundamental biology, you know, what's in the literature, and then, you know, really attempt to draw a conclusion uh, from that in so much as we can. I mean, this is a disease we knew nothing about uh, eight months ago. So really what the question is, is are tempers 2 and ACE2 co-expressed in the testis? Uh, and I'll sort of walk you through this slide here because the data is complex. Um, so the key is that both have to be expressed in the same cell to allow entry. And really to do that, you have to do single cell RNA sequencing, which essentially looks at the expression of very specific genes in the same cell on a cellular level. And the, the important phrase there is, is cell. Uh, if you look at just the tissue, you may see the expression of, of both those um, genes, but if they're not expressed in the same cell, then the virus can't get in. So this is, we put together a, a paper that was just published in Fertility and Sterility. And this data here, you know, figure one, it looks super complicated, but it's actually not. Um, it's, it's a computational biologic uh, approach using single cell sequencing. And the figure, the colorful figure on the um, left, looks at all the different types of cells in testicular tissue, such as spermatogonial stem cells, Leydig cells, myoid cells, Sertoli cells. And then it superimposes on this map the expression of ACE2 and the expression of TEMPRS2. And you can see they're, they're there, but they're sparsely expressed. If you look at the, the red, which doesn't so, show up that well, I apologize. The important thing is, is C, um, which looks at the co-expression, which is almost non-existent. Uh, I think we found it in like four of, of about uh, six or 7,000 cells. So it's, it's ex from this, it's unlikely that there's, you know, from a biologic standpoint, at least this data that we have, that the, the virus can get into uh, 
to testicular tissue cells. So other data, you know, suggests there was one paper out of Life Sciences China that looked at, uh, again, single cell sequencing, uh, normal testis cells. Granted, it was from one patient where our, our data is multiple patients that are pooled. And essentially what they found, if you look at, again, they're looking at the ACE2 receptor in the figure on top. And then, you know, if you look at uh, the figure on the bottom there, they're looking at uh, tempers 2 Interestingly, they also looked at expression in men with uh, non-obstructive azospermia and even some other um, cell lines. Um, they concluded that they may be co-expressed in some cells, which is different than what we found. There's another paper out um, from uh, Dagan Wells group uh, at Oxford that uh, looked at the same thing we did using some publicly available data sets. And they found no co-expression of ACE2 and, and TEMPERS2. BSG and CTSL are two other receptors that some people are now thinking are used to get uh, into the cell. So one paper, so you basically have three papers out there, um, two of which show that it probably can't get into the testicular tissue that used sort of a bigger data sets and one that showed that, that maybe it could. Um, so what about the, what about the semen? Does it get into the semen? Um, so this was our paper. Uh, we collaborated with scientists from Wuhan. They looked at 34 patients um, and they found no evidence of the virus in these samples. Now, comes with some important caveats. All these patients had mild to moderate illness. They, um, on average, were 31 days out from having been diagnosed um, with, with the virus. And interestingly, they had uh, about, you know, 18, 19% of them had orchitis. And it, not all of them had a physical exam. It was essentially the patient reported scrotal pain and scrotal swelling. Significance of that at this point is, is not totally uh, known. That, that Chinese group now has another 300 patients that they're, they have seam analyses and repeated measures of seam analyses as well as hormone analyses. And they're working on getting that published. Um, so recently, um, there was another paper that came out that looked at um, in JAMA Open that looked at um, clinical characteristics and results of semen tests among men with uh, coronavirus disease in uh, 2019. And this found that uh, in 50 patients, they looked at 50 patients, 12 of the patients they couldn't study because they either died, were intubated, or had severe erectile dysfunction. And that kind of gives you your first clue that these were patients who were very sick. Um, six of these patients were positive for the virus. Four had the samples done while they were in the hospital, possibly in the ICU, we don't know. So this is a much sicker cohort. And also they're giving the samples, you know, when they're, when they're sick. Um, so this is very different than what, what we found. And we'll get into some of the details of that in a minute. Um, but the important thing to remember is that they're, they're kind of, there are two different cohorts of patients. And in our paper, we said that it may be possible that there's a viral threshold beyond which, you know, people have such severe viremia that it's in every single tissue in the body. So there's another paper that the preprint just went up on fertility and sterility. It'll be coming out uh, shortly. Uh, and this showed again that SARS-CoV-2 is not in the semen. This is a German group, you know, looked at um, 32 patients and found that there's no, uh, there were no COVID in the semen. They did find, interestingly, that 25% of patients with you know, moderate illness actually had testicular pain. And none of those had SARS-CoV-2 in the semen, which is interesting. And a couple of their patients were actually pretty sick. They did find, which is a, is a really important thing, uh, if you look here in table three, they did find, you know, that sperm uh, concentration, uh, the number of sperm per ejaculate did go down significantly, you know, as did the total modal uh, count. So, what they're seeing here is the same findings that we found, and they're seeing that um, the total modal count went down. Um, in terms of why this is, there's a couple different possibilities. One is that the patients even in the German paper weren't as sick as the Chinese patients in Wuhan and that other sample from JAMA Open. Another possibility is that there was contamination. If the sample was taken while a patient was in an ICU, there may be aerosolized viral particles. That paper out of China didn't comment at all on how they did, whether they did PCR or exactly what they did for the virology. Also, the group we work with in China is also doing electron microscopy to look for the virus in, in tissues and uh, testis tissue from uh, cadaveric studies. So we'll see. So the orchitis thing is, is kind of an interesting story. 
So if you look at what happened with SARS, SARS actually did cause orchitis. And this is a paper here from 2006 that looks at control sample versus a patient with high fever, and then looking at a couple, which you see some atrophy, but then looking at uh, the SARS patients, you see actually um, inflammation uh, and vascular congestion outside the tubules, and then you actually see some fibrosis, significant fibrosis within the tubules as well, too which might be consistent with the fact that this new virus, which is kind of SARS more aggressive cousin, I guess, could be the same thing going on. The big question in my mind is, does this mean that there's long-term damage to the testis? The answer is we don't know. Uh, we really need you know, more data on this. Another great question is you know, hormone levels. We don't have data on this uh, either. And these are really important questions to answer for our field, but also for sort of society and population health. So the other important question is why do men do worse? This, this figure on the left is from a paper that uh, actually has been submitted by, by Joe Lucal, uh, who's nice enough to give it to me. And these are actually some outcomes uh, by sex uh, in New York City. As you can see, more men get sick. Men are significantly more likely to get hospitalized and men are also significantly more likely to die. Then on the right, you see another paper that basically shows that if you look at the time it takes to clear SARS-CoV, um, you know, blue is male and, and red is female and women clear the virus faster. Um, and this is looking at families. This is a pretty well done study. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the question is, why is this? And, and men have higher systemic ACE2 expression than, than women. But the data doesn't totally make sense because that expression actually declines somewhat as men get older and you know older people tend to get sicker with the virus. So we don't totally know. Another interesting point, which I didn't put a full slide on due to time, is that um, you know, Tempers 2 is also expressed in the prostate. So you know, that could theoretically be a reservoir for uh, the virus as well. So what's the impact on long-term male reproductive health? Um, I think that's probably the most important thing we need to understand. And the bottom line is it remains unknown. Preliminary data would suggest that it may not be too severe, but we really need more evidence. And we also need to look at study the impact on offspring. And that honestly is completely unknown from the male side, because as far as I'm aware, no children have been born to men who have, who have had COVID prior to conception. We really won't know the answer on a lot of this till that, uh, till that happens. So what studies are needed? Ideally, if I could design a study, this would be very hard and expensive to do, but you'd want a longitudinal large cohort studies of men with stratified into mild, moderate, and severe disease with repeated semen testing for SARS-CoV-2 every one to two weeks for, for maybe three months or a whole full cycle of spermatogenesis to document the viral presence and the sperm parameters, and maybe even the hormone levels. We need hormone data uh, to look at the impact on light against Rotoli cells, and we probably also need to look at some either cadaveric uh, testis tissue or biopsies. Some of the Chinese groups have actually taken biopsies from a good number of their patients, and you know that data will be forthcoming. Uh, we also need to understand why are men more likely to get the disease? I mean, the, the bottom line is we don't understand this virus uh, that well. Additionally, we'll wanna look at cohort studies of men who conceived while having COVID-19, and certainly um, that could be something easily done in a prospective fashion through our fertility clinics. And I would, you know, that those would be great projects for uh, a lot of, you know, reproductive endocrinologists and urologists to look at. And then again, autopsy studies doing electron microscopy of the testis and pups, possibly also the prostate to assess for the virus. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. O'Tailing. Um, that was an excellent uh, review of the scientific literature to which uh, you have been contributing to as well. And um, it is my pleasure to now introduce uh, Dr. Kathleen Wang. Uh, she's an associate professor in the Department of Urology and OBGYN at the University of Pittsburgh. She's the director of male reproductive health. And she will be talking about practicing male reproductive medicine in the era of COVID. Kathleen? Hi, everybody. Thank you to the ASRM and the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. We're going to switch gears a little bit and go through some practical advice, tips, and just realistic sort of um, challenges that we've faced trying and working through the pandemic and treating our male reproductive patients. We've just had a really great virology review on just the basis of COVID and the impact in the male reproductive tract. With the fact that it's such a highly infectious disease, we've seen how impactful it's basically in, impacted the world. And a formal pandemic 
was declared on March 11th, 2020. But just looking two months later, this was data just pulled off the CDC not a few days ago, just looking at the regional variations on how the different areas in our country have been impacted. And we're gonna see similar variations across the globe. And you can see areas that are much different in a spectrum of the number of cases. I've picked out a few select states and you can see already within differences in counties that even within certain states, there is a mix of the number of cases from very few to a very high number. We have specific states where they're very, very equally distributed across the board where there's a lot of number of cases. And then other states where they're, the vast majority of the area of the state is actually um, fortunate enough that there are not that many cases. And really the take home message is depending upon where you live, where you practice, where your hospital institution is, really is going to dictate how you're able to provide care for these patients in different settings. So as providers, we're always trying to strike a balance and are always thinking about doing no harm. But our ability to provide care for our male reproductive patients is crucial and really important for our infertile couples. But there's that balance of trying to figure out what's safe and what's risky. And having this really difficult conversation, we were all really thrust into as providers of explaining what medical and surgical management treatment options are and how we define them. What is elective versus urgent versus even emergent and what the differences are between what's a truly medically urgent consideration and a treatment concern versus what's personally very urgent, because clearly this is an urgent situation for any individual, but it was actually quite a difficult conversation to have with patients to talk through what, what truly defines a, an elective versus an urgent case. So when you talk about strategies for care, there, there clearly are two different arenas. And when we were all given the directive across the globe with the stay at home, right, very clear, everybody stay home, only true emergent cases were being brought out, essential services were being brought out, and everyone else was being told, listen, it's not safe to leave. But now we're all starting to live through different variations of states that are reopening. And that brings on many different challenges and different questions about what's appropriate and what can patients access as far as care. Next slide, please. When focusing about strategies for care during stay at home, this is pretty uniform. All elective cases are put on hold. All elective office patient visits are either rescheduled for months down the line or transitioned to telemedicine. So telemedicine has been thrust upon the vast majority of the providers across the globe as a real crash course in how to offer care through this opportunity. And no different than any other medical subspecialty, surgical subspecialty, we've had to adapt to how to utilize telemedicine in male reproductive health. Thankfully, telemedicine is, is really available in many different opportunities across smartphones, computers, tablets. And so very often it is a very reasonable and feasible option for patients to access their providers. What we have found is that the key is improving efficiency within your own office. Providing care through telemedicine is very different than providing care through an office-based setting, face-to-face -face visits. And internally, you, you have to communicate in setting patients up. We've had additional timeframes, phone calls, setups to help just adapt to setting their patient portals up into establishing their technology to make sure they have that connection. Here at our institution, we've worked very closely with our local telehealth teams, and I'm sure across the nation there are multiple telehealth teams that have been sort of rapidly formulated to help be accessible for all of the troubleshooting that happens while you're trying to provide, to provide telehealth. Another opportunity that we found has been very helpful is, is providing multiple stations across for access across many different locations in your office, inpatient setting, doing it, having the ability to do it in your car, from your phone. And so this has really um, made it much more facile. Most of us often utilize questionnaires, and this is something that patients often fill out. And what we found is that we have to anticipate, we mail out these questionnaires, whether through their email, through their portal, or even through old school snail mail, and providing these questionnaires that they will fill out and then kind of review with you through the telemedicine. So you're still achieving all of the provided answers well in advance. And I think one of the bigger challenges has been the comprehension of, of how can I bill for this? How can we document this appropriately 
so that we can all meet these EM&R codes and, and required components to make this an appropriate visit. One of what we have found pretty challenging is retraining and basically redeploying staff to different tasks. The front desk and schedulers have all been redeployed to confirming appointments, setting appointments up, confirming ability to access their portals, access the care through technology. We've had to very much come up with new algorithms to restructure patient workflow. And all of our medical assistants, nursing staff have become very facile at virtually rooming patients. So patients are having their medications verified, review of systems, questionnaires, Basically, the same thing that would have happened in an office-based setting is happening in the telehealth setting. And this is where you're really shifting patients and shifting staff to different positions. Something that is surprising is that we've actually had to work harder to minimize no-shows. So you would think with patients being at home, this should never happen. They're at home and waiting to do this. But we've actually found that you need to confirm appointments probably a little bit more diligently to help them set up the, the actual system, but also to remind them it's easy to forget when they aren't really going anyplace. Next. One of the biggest questions is how do you incorporate the physical exam? It's such a critical component to male factor infertility where the general exam is a really big part of how you determine what's necessary for treatment, what are treatment options, what are further diagnostic testing that needs to be done. I would say ultimately it's really very crucial part of discussion with the new patient consults that come in, whether this is for male factor infertility or it's for sterilization vasectomy consults. All patients need to be known and sort of discussed with that the next step, once safe, is a physical exam. That's not a part that we can skip and this is very critical. I would say there's even a smaller subset that are comfortable utilizing the video camera and again, it has to be patient and provider comfort level, and you have to have an appropriate quality of camera. But there have been some settings in patient populations where we've utilized the telemedicine video camera to do a superficial kind of genital exam. And obviously, when there's concern for deeper pathology, whether there's a concern about a mass or acute pain, this is where we're going to utilize scrotal ultrasound for more urgent cases. We've also found it's really helpful to start putting the education to the patient themselves, teaching them about testicular self-exam and about regularly doing this while they're at home to make sure that they're not developing any changes as they know their anatomy better than anybody. Some strategies that we have implemented while reopening, and every, every city is a little bit different, every hospital office setting is a little bit different, but these are some strategies that have been effective in also preserving the social distancing. The patients are treated alone. The partners are not allowed to come actually even into the building. The partner is in invited to call in during the visit to FaceTime in. They're, they can be in the car in the waiting in the uh, parking lot calling in to participate in the visit, but the patient is the only one allowed in the office. From a hospital and office building setting, I'm sure we have all had variations of this, but all people, whether patients or employees, are screened. There are single entrances and single exits identified to monitor the flow of people in and out of these buildings. There's a temperature check at every single entrance. A mask is provided to every individual. And stickers with the date and the proof of screening are provided to each person to prevent them from having to have more than a, a single screening in a day. Now, we've also had to be creative about determining how and what's the best way to schedule office appointments. Now that we're bringing patients and bringing select patients back in, we still want to optimize that social distancing. Um, we have worked very hard to minimize the number of patients in the office at the same time. So we've, we've gotten to this habit where we've been selectively alternating some patient visits where we have an office visit, the next visit would be a telehealth and then another office visit so we can stratify and just minimize the number of, of bodies in, in the same place. Another strategy is rooming the patient immediately where our, our, our patients are checked in and immediately the medical assistant is rooming them into, a, into a, a, an exam room and the remainder of that check-in process happens in there. We've also physically had to change the layout of our waiting room. Our, our chairs have been minimized as far as the number and they are physically six feet apart. And so you are providing every opportunity to remain safe while, while we are still providing care. 
surgical considerations now that we are slowly opening up. One opportunity is, is that our, our system, we are regularly testing patients for, for COVID preoperatively. And one of, the, one of the main concerns from all perspectives is how do we protect everybody involved? And so for the staff, I think the strategic concerns have all centered around the intubation and the extubation process. One opportunity to allow providers to make that decision is, is quite frankly, the anesthesia team here, these are the only staff that are with the patient during intubation. Any other staff have the ability to stay in the room, but they have to wear an N95 mask for the duration of the case. And again, this is a time for us to, to try to decide if, if the patient really requires a general anesthetic. Are they an appropriate candidate for spinal anesthesia? And so this is, this is definitely making providers and surgeons think a little bit more, more thoughtfully about what they're offering. And considerations for laparoscopy, these are very real as well. We have electrosurgery units and all these type of things where things get aerosolized. And the ORs have been very thoughtful about uh, improving their inline filters for CO2 insufflation, implementing active smoke evacuation where maybe you would not have utilized this um, right away. So there are many different avenues of, of being able to offer care, but having to be a little bit more thoughtful about how you execute. And what, when we talk about male factor evaluation, one of the most critical kind forms is, is that, that cornerstone of a semen analysis that really jumpstarts all male factor evaluation, whether it's for introductory evaluation for male factor like we just talked about, or if it's for follow-up testing after an intervention. Lab services that we're often dealing with are IUI washes, testicular tissue processing for sperm retrievals. And this has been a challenging thing because most labs have been closed for um, these diagnostic and elective testing purposes. I would say that for fertility preservation, this has been a very unique situation where many labs across the country have still remained accessible for these exact um, services. But we've also had to become very creative about answering patients' questions about, is it okay to delay checking these labs? How can I facilitate this? So some of the biggest questions we've been getting, and, and again, even though we're, we have not been maybe as busy over the past two months seeing patients in the office, our communication with patients certainly has become a bit even overwhelming in how many questions we get and, and phone calls. And a lot of our patients are calling about what are the opportunities for home testing? How can I check my semen sample at home? What are send out testing opportunities? What are fertility preservation options that may not have anything to do with malignancy, but just as an elective choice to preserve their fertility? Are there services that I can you know, access from home? And for the, our vasectomy patients who underwent a vasectomy procedure, but their post-procedure follow-up followed, just sort of fell into that pandemic arena. And they've been very curious about when can I have my post vasectomy semen analysis checked. So in summary, I think everyone at this, at this stage really believes that it's still really critical to continue and evaluate reproductive health concerns for our couples, even in the setting of a crisis. What I've learned is communication is paramount. Number one, to, to really maintain communication with the patient, the couple, but also facilitating communication within our office to be able to um, adapt to the times and implement telehealth where maybe we were not as facile before. And I really do believe that telehealth options, while we, for the most of us, we had to take a pretty quick crash course in getting, getting um, comfortable with this opportunity. It really is here to stay as it's shown its ability to um, offer care and, and access to care for many patients and patients are actually very appreciative and grateful for this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for an excellent presentation. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Eisenberg. He is an associate professor of urology and obstetrics and gynecology. He's the director of men's health and male reproductive medicine and surgery at Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, he will be talking about home sperm testing and cryopreservation during the COVID era. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, and I also want to thank um, not just the organizers, but really the, the entire ASRM for uh, the leadership during these difficult times. You know, my goal is to look at some of the home options, uh, home testing, home sperm cryopreservation options uh, for male factor infertility. And so 
These are the learning objectives at the conclusion to understand the current offerings and home sperm testing. We'll look at some of the strengths and limitations, then understand the offerings and home sperm cryopreservation. So these are my disclosures, um, and some of which actually are relevant. So Stanstone Diagnostics and Daddy both are going to make some of the offerings that we're going to discuss. Uh, the others are not so much relevant for this. So these are some of the home tests that we're going to review. There's a lot that have been uh, developed over the years. <clears throat> These are um, some of the main ones. So we're gonna discuss them all in turn. We'll talk about how they work, uh, whether they have FDA approval or not, and then some of the data on their accuracy. And so why would we want to have this done? Obviously, um, you know, we're getting a constant reminders around the country that things are opening up. And so I think hopefully a lot of this is gonna become less and less relevant over time uh, in some ways <clears throat> for our only line of, of evaluation for men, but this is still a very important tool. And so for couples trying to conceive, this is a nice entry uh, into testing. Uh, it, can improve, it can improve access for patients that sometimes find it difficult uh, to see a specialist or to get to the clinic for testing. Um, it can be a way that patients can follow their treatments uh, to see if things are improving over time. You know, some patients may have a suspicion that they uh, do have impaired semen quality, whether prior genetic toxic exposure. They may have certain conditions that are known to affect spermatogenesis, for example, uh, uh, a man who is, as an adolescent, was diagnosed with a varicocele after vasectomy uh, is another opportunity uh, to check. Some men are just curious, and then also it does open the opportunities for uh, research as well. For those that are uh, very interested in some of these home testing options, there's an excellent review uh, published in Andrology in 2017. So I would encourage anyone that's interested uh, for more information to, to read this publication. So first we'll get into the actual um, of the devices. So the first is sperm check fertility. It was FDA approved in 2010. So it's been on the market for quite a while. It's available in some local drugstores. It's a semi-quantitative test. So what I mean by that is it does not give you an exact number, but it gives you ranges. So you can see it gives less than 5 million, between 5 and 20 million, greater than 20 million. It doesn't measure motility or volume. So it doesn't give everything that a conventional semen analysis would provide, but it does give uh, some important information. It works by um, combining a detergent with the sperm that solubilizes sperm macrosomal membranes, releasing a certain protein, which then mixed with a buffer, which uh, then undergoes an, an, a reaction with a monoclonal antibody, uh, which then can be read out um, visually. This is uh, the validation study published in Human Reproduction, uh, where they compared lay users to experienced laboratory technicians, and you can see a very good uh, reproducibility, 95%, very good accuracy. Compared to standard semen analysis results, you can see uh, sensitivity specificity over 90% for both. The next product we'll discuss is YoSperm. So this was FDA approved in 2010, received a CE mark in 2017. Uh, unlike the prior one, this actually measures modal sperm concentration. And this again is semi-quantitative. It gives you less than 6 million modal sperm count or greater than 6 million. This has also been validated with a double, in a double blind fashion. So what this does is it actually has a device that hooks up to a smartphone. So you need to make sure that when you order it, you're ordering the, uh, you're, you're kind of lining it up for your correct uh, model. It works by measuring uh, the life fluctuations caused by the sperm movement in the video. And it translates these movements into a modal sperm concentration. And then it can give you a, what's called a YO score. Uh, this is the validation study that was published in Fertility and Sterility. And what they did is they, they looked at um, the semen analysis by a, a CASA machine versus the numbers given by the Yosperm, either using the iPhone 7 or the Galaxy S7. And again, you can see very good accuracy across the different devices. Uh, the next product we'll talk about is by Sansa Diagnostics called TRAC, and this uses a centrifuge. So you can see in the middle here, a centrifuge is spinning. So essentially what's done is the semen analysis is collected uh, into a cup where you can measure the volume. And then after the, the semen liquefies, you take a sample and place it in the middle of the centrifuge, which then spins. Next slide. So you can see the propeller here on the left, and then you can see at the, in the bottom in the middle, there's sort of white columns. So that's a sperm pellet, sort of like a spermatocrit, you can imagine, and you can see the height and again, this is a semi-quantitative test. So you can look, you have these different um, cut points, greater than 55 million, between 15 and 55 million, and below 15 million. And then on the right, um, 
Uh, this company also got FDA approval for their special collection device. So you can actually, again, measure the volume. So you can see if man has normal volume or low volume. You can see, um, in, again, in the validation here, there's good accuracy between uh, the track results and sperm concentration as measured by a CASA machine. They do have a motility assay for research purposes, again, with good accuracy uh, compared to a CASA machine. And this is data uh, we've been involved with the company uh, with a, a research grant with Boston University, um, sending these to couples around the country attempting to conceive. And this simple graph just shows that there is a correlation, as we would expect, between a sperm concentration and time to pregnancy, and just validating it for research purposes as well. Moving on, the next test is swim count. So the swim count essentially measures um, the number of moving sperm. So a sample is placed into a chamber. Uh, the modal sperm then swim up. Uh, there's a detection window where uh, the modal sperm are actually identified, and then you get a readout looking at the numbers. Again, this gives you a semi-quantitative test, so less than 5 million, between 5 and 20, and greater than 20 million. You can see the sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, all around uh, 90%. And this also received FDA approval uh, in 2019. Another product uh, called the Tenga Ball Lens Microscope. Uh, this allows, uh, again, interface with a smartphone to be able to identify uh, sperm at home. Essentially, this is a um, user collects a sample, uses a, uh, a ball lens microscope that aligns with specific smartphone uh, a man has, and then you can create video, which then can be uploaded onto a website where you get um, calculations for the concentration and motility. Uh, th this uh, was initially described in fertility and sterility. You can see the sensitivity and specificity are also very good, about 90%. And here we see uh, validation across different uh, smartphone interfaces, 6S, 5S, iPhones, and LG phone, and then a good and then again, uh, you can see concentration, motility, and uh, total modal count. Again, uh, good accuracy across the different platforms. Next, we have a product called Fertility Score. This is only a, this is available uh, on Amazon in the United Kingdom. There is some data suggesting good accuracy. It reports a binary outcome greater than or less than 20 million sperm per milliliter. The idea is that metabolic active sperm will chemically change the structure and color of a dye that's added, and the color changed from dark blue to pink, unable to find any um, further data about the product. Another product called Exceed Home Sperm uh, Testing. It's available online, not FDA approved. Uh, it's smartphone compatible. Uh, similar to the other smartphone products that we've discussed, essentially you collect a sample, you put it into um, a panel that then uh, links to your smartphone, so that pictures can be obtained, and then that can then be converted uh, to uh, a modal sperm count. Seam is another product, uh, kind of a similar idea. It's by a Japanese company. It's not FDA approved. You collect the sample, wait for it to liquefy, place the sample in a magnifying lens, and then place that lens on the smartphone. You use a downloaded app to calculate concentration and motility. I was unable to find um, accuracy data on this product as well. So those are some of the home offerings um, that are available. So let's talk about sperm cryopreservation and why would men do that? Well, there's certainly many reasons, you know, obviously for fertility preservation around the time of cancer therapy. Um, that's one of the most common and widely thought of uh, indications, but there may be other gonadotoxic treatments, not for malignancies. Um, you know, there are certain conditions like thalassemias, um, autoimmune disorders where stem cell treatments are necessary. Patients uh, should be counseled if they're reproductive age. Think about uh, freezing sperm. Um, for uh, gender affirming hormone therapy, that'd be another indication. Sometimes it could be occupational risk, you know, whether it be law enforcement, astronauts, um, military, all um, fertility preservation has been described in all of those. And those aren't necessarily things that are going to stop during a pandemic, obviously. So, want to maintain uh, access uh, for men uh, and women with these conditions. Uh, so during the time of the pandemic, 
many centers did stay open specifically for these indications and in li some limited capacity. Uh, but it's important to know, you know, for uh, for individuals that don't have access to these, you know, maybe some in uh, some rural settings, there there are home offerings as well. So again, you know, local sperm banks uh, should certainly be you know queried during all times. And you know, these are a list of some. You know, during uh, the pandemic, you know, our center here at Stanford maintained open for this indication. We weren't doing routine semen analysis, but for fertility preservation around cancer therapy, uh, we were offering services. Uh, but in the last few years, there have been really a, a surge in the number of home offerings for this. And these are some of the ones that are available. Um, I found them through web searches and through my own just knowledge of the, um, uh, the space. These are just listed in alphabetical order. <clears throat> the prices vary a little bit. There's oftentimes um, different promotions that are run, but essentially the idea is that you either call or access through a website or an app. You would fill out what particular package you want to purchase. Kits are sent to your house. You make a deposit and then you send them in. And you know, one thing that sort of allowed this is there are now um, uh, cryopreservation solutions that allow transport across the country. Uh, these companies also have, you know, proprietary uh, shipping packages that allow them to maintain at a certain temperature, which obviously they potentially could vary, you know, given how transportation works through planes and, you know, endless time on trucks. <clears throat> it's also important to know for a lot of these, you know, offerings that they, in addition to freezing sperm, they also do provide, um, you know, the semen report. So this is another method for a man to get a test from home. You know, it's sent to a, a central laboratory where, you know, standard parameters such as volume, concentration, motility can be assessed, and then a man can get that, that report as well. So just to conclude, there's many products on the market for home sperm testing. They use a variety of technologies uh, to achieve that. They do have good accuracies. Um, there are companies, again, that allow one to collect at home and then send in the sample, uh, just again for diagnostic purposes. And then cryopreservation should be continued by centers that allow for sperm cryopreservation, um, you know, whether it be in office or again with these um, mail-in home collection samples as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We will now open up the floor to questions for our panelists. Dr. Barhama will be moderating the session. Great. Thank you, Michael, for a, uh, an uh, uh, excellent presentation as well. Um, so I think that uh, there are some good questions uh, coming through. Uh, one of the questions, uh, which I'll start with um, with Jim, is twofold. Um, what is the risk to the andrology uh, lab personnel or the embryologists that we work with? Um, and maybe you can comment on how uh, you treat orchitis uh, in this uh, situation. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So the the first part of it is, I mean, the answer fully is we don't we don't totally know. Um, I think the the you know two of the three studies that have been done on this indicate that COVID is not uh, in semen, and some suspect that. Um, that that study that was done in China, um, you know, some people have potentially some concerns for methodologic issues. Um, I think if um, in andrology labs, if you're handling samples from patients who are recovering or recovered from COVID, I think the risk is relatively low from what we can see. Um, I don't know that you'd need to have more than standard precautions. In terms of treating orchitis, I mean, there's not, uh, there's not some drug that we have at this point to treat the vitae the virus, it would largely be like supportive care, you know, with, with NSAIDs, ICE, and, and care for uh, symptomatic uh, treatment, maybe Tylenol. Okay, um, another question. Um, in men with COVID um, who um, want to protect their fertility or preserve their fertility, um, Michael, maybe you can start, and Kathleen can comment, and Jim as well. Are you suggesting that they do testing? Or are you suggesting that they freeze? Or, um, you know, couples that have started the fertility process and kind of put it on hold, been positive with COVID, are you reassessing that individual's fertility status uh, post-COVID? And if so, uh, what is your 
uh, method of preference? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we have not had that situation arise yet. The prevalence here um, in Northern California, fortunately, is very low. Um, but we are testing aggressively, um, and I think like many other centers, prior to, you know, couples beginning um, IVF treatment. So, you know, based on the literature that Jim reviewed, you know, we would certainly, you know, check again, I think, before they, you know, initiated a cycle again, especially if a patient was symptomatic with, with COVID, we'd want to make sure they hopefully return to baseline values. Obviously, we don't know the long-term effects of COVID infection, um, but hopefully similar to other viruses uh, or many viruses, we would see, uh, you know, resolution with time. Uh, you know, in terms of fertility preservation, I never discourage a man from freezing sperm. I think that we don't have data on, you know, potentially the, the harm of this yet. And again, it sort of depends on local prevalence, you know, how likely, this, um, but if a man is interested in fertility preservation, I give, you know, the information that essentially I passed on today that there are many centers uh, and, and services available and you know if a man wants to do that I think that's certainly reasonable. Right. Uh, question to Kathleen. Um, so what tools uh, or procedures uh, do you uh, provide uh, to give patients confidence that the environment that you have uh, in, pra in the practice right now is uh, is safe how do you you know uh, establish a return to you know uh, confidence level and then i think that after that I, i'd like maybe all three of you to just comment um and we'll conclude after that um on the on another question but kathleen why don't you start with that so i would say what's different now during the pandemic than before is there's so much a higher level of need for reassurance and it doesn't always um, speak as loudly unless you're hearing it directly from your physician directly. And so I've had to make a lot of phone calls personally to confirm appointments to kind of reassure patients that we are going through the appropriate manners and the screening is happening at like the hospital setting level and that we're doing everything using all these strategies that we've talked about to maintain that social distancing and to maintain that safety level for everybody involved. And sometimes it takes a little bit of reassurance. It also takes a little bit of a reminder that it's not about any individual, but about everybody who's involved in their care, from the patient themselves to the providers, to their families, who at this point we're still discouraging from coming in. And that's sometimes really hard to say, you have to come in by yourself, even for a discussion that can be a little overwhelming for certain patients. And so we've made it a very big deal to lead up to their appointment, which is communicating with them, communicating with them that we are going to encourage to have their partners call in, have their partners FaceTime in. And so they're still part of the care, it's just they're not physically there. And so that has been a really, helpful way um, to reassure patients that it's safe to come in in very strategic ways. But it has taken a little bit of manpower to increase the communication with patients, and a lot of it is by me personally. Great, thank you. Um, so the last question, what part of this experience in terms of how you've changed your practice moving forward uh, would you like to uh, uh, continue and make more permanent? Yeah, I think um, I guess if I think you would ask me first, I would say there's there's a couple aspects. Um, one, I don't I don't think telehealth is going away. I think it's it's easier for patients. I mean, I've done consults with patients in their car while they were working a backhoe. You know, all kinds of all kinds of interesting things. It gives you some interesting insights into them, their lives. But but I think it is very patient centric and. Um, and I've sort of realized there really is a lot of what we can do uh, remotely. I think that's that's one thing. I think also there's going to be a big push for point of care diagnostics um, that will facilitate, you know, patients getting more exams. And then I, I would sort of say the third thing is, I mean, I think one thing that's been pretty incredible is how the reproductive medicine community, uh, among other communities, has really mobilized to focus on this. And it's pretty unbelievable to see how much progress can be made collectively on one one issue when we're all working towards a common goal. Um, and hopefully that's something that's not going to go uh, away. And, you know, bodies like the ASRM and the SMRU can turn their attention to to specific areas and make very meaningful progress very rapidly. So those to impact patient care. Great. Kathleen? 
I think I would echo what Jim just said. I mean, that was exactly the points that I would bring up. I think absolutely for some that, you know, I was never that familiar with telehealth before this all happened. And now that's really become a big portion of how I access care with patients and they really love it. I mean, we have patients who are driving in for from four or five hours away. And so it really changes their ability to make appointments and to make facilitate their care for that, which is great. Also, I think outlining just how amazing having our societies work together, just as Jim said, I mean, having these sort of COVID guidance sort of statements coming from the ASRM and the SMRU working together and the SRS and all these different sub societies has really been kind of amazing to see. So very hope that this would is sort of the launching pad for collaborative work moving forward. Michael? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo exactly what was said. I think certainly telehealth in my own practice uh, has really exploded. Um, you know, I think just here at, at our whole, uh, you know, institution, I think it's become a lot more common and you just see the benefits. I think that certainly there was some hesitation to anytime you adopt new technology, but um, there's really been a lot of infrastructure that's been invested, you know, since the pandemic began. And that's really been encouraging. And then I think the other thing that uh, this has really taught me in addition to, um, you know, the points about collaboration is just how really the scientific community has really embraced this. You know, I've been able to see how quickly some of these publications have been, you know, been put out into the community so other people can benefit from them. You know, some of these papers have been turned around in, you know, about 48 hours, which is really amazing when you think about the normal process uh, from submission to eventual publication. So just realizing, you know, sometimes you have to put aside, you know, politics or other things really to get, get the word out and get the knowledge out really to benefit the community. Well, thank you all for participating. I really want to, um, you know, um, the future is is uncertain, but with leadership like Kathleen and, and Michael and, and Jim, the collaboration and, and, and the ability to get things done in a collaborative fashion is really something that I think we'll all take with us moving into the future. And um, these type of webinars are important for our audience, our societies, uh, but really uh, enable us to, to help our colleagues and uh, the medical community uh, in dealing with this crisis. So thank you all and um, um, look forward to seeing you. And in the meantime, hope you're all safe and well and healthy. Thank you, Dr. Barhama. Thank you to our panelists, moderator attendees. You will receive a survey by email after this session. Your feedback helps us give you the most relevant content. Your input is appreciated. This session was recorded and will be available on our website in the near future. Please join us for our next webinar schedule for Thursday, June the 4th on donor anonymity, past promises, evolving technologies, and current realities. For any further questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us at webinars at asrm.org. This concludes the webinar. Thank you.